Hi, everyone. Hey, thank you so much again for connecting with me online, whether it's on Facebook or YouTube or whatever. I am so grateful for this opportunity. Thank you for connecting and for watching this. You know, we're coming down to the wire in this whole election thing. Um, I haven't heard much talk lately, just within this last week. Maybe it's because we've um, already voted, <laughs> most of us, right? It also could be that, you know, people are really sensing the anxiety and the tension that's in the air. But, um, you know, there's a, a Utah governor's race that has gone viral because of something really, really refreshing that these two hopefuls have decided to do. Take a look at this. I'm Chris Peterson. And I'm Spencer Cox. We are currently in the final days of campaigning against each other to be your next governor. And while I think you should vote for me. Yeah, but, but really you should vote for me. There are some things we both agree on. We can debate issues without degrading each other's character. We can disagree without hating each other. And win or lose in Utah, we work together. So let's show the country that there's a better way. My name's Chris Peterson. And I'm Spencer Cox. And we, we approve, approve this message. I don't know, is that cool or what? I just, it has been a breath of fresh air. And you know, even with regard to, you know, responses from people. I haven't seen anything negative. In fact, even on their YouTube channel, it was on Spencer Cox's YouTube channel. I think, you know, there were thousands of thumbs up and I think there were four thumbs down. So for the most part, I think everybody's saying, wow, if only politics could be more like that, um, you know, with civility, with mutual respect. And I think that's part of what we've been wanting to gain from these messages that I've been showing, thanks to Andy Stanley and North Point Community Church. But, um, you know, it goes much bigger than that. Here, here's one more uh, that I saw from these two, Spencer Cox, Chris, uh, Chris Peterson, coming together and really letting them know that, hey, they disagree, but they can disagree agreeably. Check this out. I'm Spencer Cox, your Republican candidate for Utah governor. And I'm Chris Peterson, your Democratic candidate for governor. We are currently in the final days of campaigning against each other. But our common values transcend our political differences, and the strength of our nation rests on our ability to see that. We are both equally dedicated to the American values of democracy, liberty, and justice for all people. We just have different opinions on how to achieve those ideals. But today, we are setting aside those differences to deliver a message that is critical for the health of our nation. That whether you vote by mail or in person, Person, we will fully support the results of the upcoming presidential election, regardless of the outcome. Although we sit on different sides of the aisle, we are both committed to American civility and a peaceful transition of power. And we hope Utah will be an example to the nation. Because that is what our country is built on. Please stand with us on behalf of our great state and nation. My name's Spencer Cox. And I'm Chris Peterson. And we, we approve, approve this message. message. Again, I don't know if you're like me, but I found this very, very refreshing. And maybe it's because I'm a person who doesn't like animosity and I don't like, you know, hateful conflict. I don't know. Some people might relish that. I, I personally don't. But I just found these two men, uh, even when I saw them interviewed on TV, uh, just a mutual admiration, even though they completely disagree with each other on so many things. And yet they realize, you know, the value of each other. And you know, we run the risk of dividing over some things that are very important. I'm not trying to minimize anything. There are some propositions that are very important. Of course, this you know, presidential race is very, very important. And the fact of the matter is, is these are some important issues. But what we're going to see today in this message from Andy Stanley, it's part three in this series called Talking Points. And um, this is the last message that he shared. He shared it back in January with his church. And I know it was a help. I know it was an encouragement to them. But, um, but, he's, but we're going to see that there's something much bigger than just being civil. Um, it's wonderful for us to be kind and respectful to each other, but there's something even bigger than that. And that's what Andy's going to be sharing with us today as we look at part three of this series. This message today is called Kingdom First. Enjoy.
question. Are you familiar with this? The fundamental attribution error. Anybody, just raise your hand, anybody heard of the fundamental attribution error? Yes, virtually nobody. Good. I like to know things you don't know because it makes me look smart. So anyway, the <laughs> fundamental attribution error is actually a cognitive bias that we have all been sucked into, especially during a political season. And it goes like this. The co the, this, this cognitive bias causes us to attribute people's behavior to their character. The reason he acts that way is because that's what he really is and that's who he really is. The reason she behaves that way and the reason she believes that way is because that's an indication of who she really is on the inside. But we don't do that when it comes to our behavior. When it comes to us, we attribute our behavior to circumstances and environmental factors. Let me give you an illustration. So he's late, that guy, you know, he's late, that guy at work, he's late. You know why he's late? Because he's lazy and he's irresponsible and he's just disorganized, that's why he's late. And then you're late. And you've never once looked in the mirror. So you know what the problem is? I'm lazy and I'm irresponsible and I'm just disorganized. No, just the, just the opposite for you. You've decided the reason I'm late is because I was helping my kids get ready for school. The reason I'm late, I was on the phone with a friend. I'm actually very organized and very responsible. In fact, I'm so organized and responsible, I'm late, right? This is how it works. The fundamental attribution bias happens when we assume that a person's actions reflect what kind of person they really is, what kind of person she is, rather than social and environmental factors. And we talked a lot about this last week. So when it comes to the political scene, this is what it sounds like. The corrupt Democrats, they're just corrupt. You know why they act that way? They're corrupt. That's their character, they're all corrupt. The heartless Republicans, you know why they vote that way? You know why they believe that way? Because I've met all of them, I've done research, I know every single Republican is heartless, they're heartless. No, you're corrupt, no, you're heartless, no, you're corrupt, no, you're heartless. No, you've all been sucked into this cognitive bias. Well, clearly something's wrong with these people, right? Something's wrong deep on the inside, right? The Democrats are all socialists, I mean, we know they are. Well, the Republicans are all racist, they won't admit it. Right, you're not gonna admit they're racist, but we know they're racist. We can see their hearts, every single one of them. Now, I hate to burst your bubble and you're gonna hate me for this. So you hate me now, but then over lunch, you know, kind of think about this. Mature, emotionally intelligent, curious, empathetic people, they don't fall for that. But political rhetoric feeds this. And political rhetoric grabs us by the nose and leads us into saying all kinds of silly things and believing all kinds of silly things that just aren't true. And you're better than that. And I'm better than that. So let's just not do that anymore. In fact, you can call people out when they start doing that. You can say, you know, you're suffering from a cognitive bias. <laughs> They'll just look at you like, what? And say, yeah, you're just suffering from a cognitive bias. I am emotionally, I'm emotionally you know, um, intelligent and I'm empathetic and so I don't suffer from that. I used to, but then I heard this fabulous sermon that helped me understand what was going on, right? When we choose to carry someone's burden, Galatians 6, 2, we talked about this last week, right? When we choose, we have to choose to carry someone's burden, do you know what we do? We listen, we learn, and we lean in. When we choose to carry somebody's burden, what divides us diminishes and what unites us surfaces. We fear less, we understand more. And what we're gonna to discover today is this is how the church began and this is how the world changed. So if you haven't been with us, we're in part three of this series, Talking Points, the perfect blend of politics and religion. And yes, I came up with the subtitle myself. You can decide how perfect it is. And we've said throughout this series that the church should be the safest place in the world to talk about anything. And the church should certainly be the safest place to talk about politics. Um, we rarely talk about politics. Some of you grew up in churches where you talked about politics all the time. But isn't it true if you grew up in a church that talked about politics all the time, you only talked about politics from one side of the argument, right? And so churches get known for being super left or super right or more Republican or more Democrat. And we have hopefully avoided that with all of our churches. But in this season with what's going on in our nation and with what's going on on television, we've decided we're gonna talk about politics. And we've said that the issue that Christians need to wrestle to the ground is not which party to be a part of. The issue that every single Jesus follower has to wrestle to the ground is this. Are we willing to put our faith filter ahead of our political filter? And this is very difficult to do. It's so difficult to do that most of you think you've already done it. It's so difficult to do that most American Christians think they've already done it. It's so difficult to do they can't even see that it's something that needs to be done. And many of us aren't willing to do this. 
Some of you, I'm not sure, can do this. But if you're a Jesus follower, you have to put your faith filter ahead of your political filter. To be a Christ follower first and a Republican, Democrat, Libertarian, or Independent second. And what I hope to convince you of today, what I hope to convince you of today is this, that when we do, things change in culture and society. We do the world a huge disfavor when we wrap our political ideologies with the teaching of Jesus and everybody tries to do this. So if you don't hear anything else I say, hear this. Jesus did not come to be a footnote to a political platform. He did not come to support an existing structure. As we said last week, he didn't come to take sides. He came to take what? Over, thank you, that's right. Tony Evans said he didn't come to take sides, he came to take over. He came to replace everything that was in place. Jesus is the king who came to reverse the order of things. And when we edit, and when we parse, and when we filter Jesus to fit a party platform, we rob the world, not just our communities and our nation. We rob the world, listen, we rob the world of the message that changed the world. We cannot be first and foremost party people. And I'm not talking about your freshman year in college, okay? We must be kingdom people. We must be kingdom people who are willing to influence our, our parties. When forced to choose, come on, let's get real. When forced to choose between you know, the lesser of two evils, you still have to call out the evil. When forced to choose between two imperfect candidates, two imperfect platforms and imperfect planks within the platform, we have to call out those imperfections and not for our sake and not even for a party's sake, for the world's sake. Now, is this a big deal? This is a really big deal. Early Christians lost their lives over this and early Christians began to reshape the world Be cause of this. They refused unconditional loyalty to the emperors, even the good ones. And in doing so, they moved the ethical and the moral needle for the empire. And do you know how they did it? They did it through culturally disruptive unity. In a world that honored and was organized around citizenship and wealth and power, where people purchased their way up the ladder and purchased their way to social standing, the ecclesia of Jesus, the gathering of Jesus, the assembly, the congregation of Jesus that would later be called the church, it stood in direct opposition to all of that. It was disturbing, it was unsettling, it was actually dangerous to the empire. This is why the empire decided to strike back. Just kidding, this is why the empire <laughs> decided to, take, to, to, uh, to impose sanctions on Christians and force Christians to declare that Caesar was Lord. They realized that this was a threat to the empire. And here's why, and there's no way to exaggerate this, and there's no way to describe it adequately, and there's no way to elicit in us the emotion that those first century and second century Christians felt. Classes of people, classes of people whose circles rarely overlapped and only when it was unavoidable, came together voluntarily, came together voluntarily and regularly to worship the crucified God. And this was baffling. This was baffling to people of the empire. And why did people who never had anything to do with it, I mean, this, the, the structure, social structure was so stratified and so separated. And why did they overcome social norms? And why did they overcome prejudices? And why did they come overcome their racism? And why did they overcome you know, their class um, separation and their class distinctives? Why would they come together to worship the crucified God? because the message of Jesus was so clear. I've come to establish a new kind of kingdom and everyone is invited to participate in it, in this disruptive kingdom. We can't imagine how countercultural, how disturbing, how dangerous the apostle Paul's words were. We read them like, oh yeah, whatever. Because what is self, we've talked about this, what is self-evident to us was not self-evident in the first and second century. But because of the message of Jesus and the power of the church and the power of the cross, what was just disgusting has become self-evident to us because of Christianity. The apostle Paul writes these words, we read right over them like, yeah, well, duh, yeah. But this was, these were showstoppers. This was, this was like, what? There is neither Jew nor Gentile. Wait, 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 wait. No, that's not how it works. We got Yahweh. Yes, we do. We got Yahweh. How about you? He's our God. 
Wait, 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 we were sharing Yahweh? Wait, wait, the gen- wait, we're all worshiping the same God? Wait, okay, I gotta invite Gentiles into my home and get Gentile cooties? Wait, I gotta do stuff with Jews? The Jews have ignored us our whole life. We have nothing in common. They won't let us date their daughters. I mean, they're, they're, and Paul says, oh, those days are over. No, no, they can't possibly be over. They eat weird stuff and you know, they wear strange stuff. And they have. Paul says, oh, those days are over. There's a new king in town. There's a new kingdom. And what has been a source of, you know, of, of conflict and a source of tension, that's all gone away because all have sinned and fallen short and all find salvation the same way. And what used to divide you has the potential to unite you. There is no Jew. There is no Gentile. Wow. This next one, again, we're like, duh, but I'm telling you, this was disruptive to the, to the, to the economy. It was disruptive to everything they knew. It was not self-evident. There is neither slave nor free in this brand new upside down kingdom. Wait, 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 wait. You're telling me that God views me with the same esteem and dignity that he views my master? Wait, wait, you're, wait you're, you're telling me that God sees my slaves the same way he sees me? I mean, everybody knows some people are born to rule and some people are born to be ruled over. I mean, this is, every, this is just common sense. It's the way the world works. It's self-evident. Some people are born to be ruled. Some people are born to be ruled over. I've heard this my whole life. And now you're saying there's this new system where slaves and freedmen and masters and rich and poor and citizens and non-citizens, they all come together. And when they're together in this context, this ecclesia, we're equal. What kind of kingdom is that? So disruptive. Seeds of revolution had been sown with the words of Jesus and the Apostle Paul. Then it got worse. Nor is there male and female. Now, here's something we can't just even begin to get our minds around. Slavery in the ancient world wasn't like slavery when we think about slavery in the United States of America. Slavery in the United States of America was driven by racism, by color of skin. In the ancient world, it's hard for us to imagine, everybody was a potential slave to somebody. You miss your house payment, they come for your house and your daughter. You miss your horse payment, they come for your horse and your son. Everybody, just about everybody is somebody's potential slave. And in a culture where everybody just about is someone's potential slave, the dignity of women drops off the table to a degree that we can't even begin to imagine. Women would have no dignity, no standing in a, in, a, in a culture that was driven by slave trading, that everybody could possibly be somebody else's property. Women just, again, the dignity of women, there was virtually none except in a few pockets where there was wealth and you were related to the right people. And Paul comes along and says, let me just tell you something. In this new kingdom, with this new value system, with this new king, men and women, have the same dignity, the same standing. And of course, the men are hearing this going, if the women find out about this, man, fortunately, most of them can't read, right? Later, the apostle Paul, in, in his letter to the a church in Colossae, that we call the book of Colossians, he says this, this is amazing. He talks about men and women. He says, actually, it was, it was Peter, I'm sorry, not Paul. Peter says this, he says, hey, men, you need to be careful how you treat your wives. They are joint heirs with you in the kingdom. They are joint heirs with you in terms of what's to come. That you have the same master, that you are accountable to your heavenly father on how you treat your heavenly father's daughter. She's your wife, she is his daughter. And suddenly the dignity of, this is why I say, and I know it sounds crazy ladies and and women, please don't be offended. I don't know why every woman wouldn't at least consider following Jesus. If for no other reason, what he did for the status of women and the seeds that he sowed in terms of the status of women, it's extraordinary. It is absolutely extraordinary. It's common sense to us. It was not common sense in the first, second, or third, or even the centuries that followed. And he says, yeah, four. You are all one in Christ Jesus. Wait, I'm one with women and women are one with slaves and slaves are one with masters. Yeah, it's it's a new way of thinking. It's a new world order. One is in no distinction, equal value, equal dignity. This was so disruptive. I'm telling you, if this caught on, if this caught on, the fabric of the empire would unravel and it caught on. 
And Jesus predicted it would. Looking into the future, he makes this statement. It's so powerful. It's one of my favorite verses in the New Testament. Certainly one of my favorite things that Jesus said. He said, the law and the prophets, talking about the entire, what we would call the Old Testament. The law and the prophets were proclaimed until John the Baptist. But after John the Baptist, a new king stepped onto planet Earth and everything began to change. Since John the Baptist, since that time, the good news of a brand new kingdom, the good news of the kingdom of God is being preached. And look at this. And everyone is forcing their way into it. Everyone, their eyes are being opened. They're, being, they're beginning to recognize the world in a different way. They're beginning to see themselves in a different way. They're beginning to see other people in a different way. This isn't a tweak. This is a wholesale change. This is a new paradigm. This is the upside down kingdom of God. And Jesus has introduced it to the world and we have been invited to participate in it and more importantly, we are stewards of God's kingdom and our communities and our nation and in our world. This is why it would be so foolish, so foolish for any local church or any group of churches or the church in general to ever be divided over political issues or a political party because those parties will one day be over and Jesus will still be the king. So work with me. 45 years after the apostle Paul is executed in Nero's Rome, 45 years after the apostle Paul is executed in Nero's, Peter has also been executed in Nero's Rome. 45 years go by. When the apostle Paul dies and Peter dies, it's like, oh no, the two, you know, the two superheroes of the faith. I mean, these are the guys with the superpowers, literally of the faith, they're dead. So does that mean Rome won? Does that mean the temple won? No, Christianity just continued to spread like crazy. So 45 years after the apostle Paul is executed in Nero's Rome, Pliny the Younger, who was the governor of an area or region that was in, in our modern day Turkey, realizes that as a governor, it's his responsibility to put down the, the growth of the church because the emperor has sent out an edict that we have to stop the spread of Christianity because the gods are angry. It wasn't too long after this that the edges of the Roman Empire began to fray. And so the Romans were trying to figure out what's wrong, what's wrong. Well, the gods are angry. What would make the gods angry? The gods aren't being sacrificed to the way they used to be. And who's the culprit behind the gods not being sacrificed to? It must be these Christians. So there's an edict that goes out that you're to round up and arrest Christians and you're to force them to sacrifice to the emperor. They don't have to quit believing one thing, but they've at least got to acknowledge that the emperor is Lord or the emperor is their ultimate, they have to swear their ultimate allegiance to the emperor. So Pliny the Younger decides, hey, you know, I've got to do what the emperor says, but I'm not even sure what, why we're doing this. I mean, I, I, I haven't noticed a disturbance, you know, in our community because of these Christians. So he writes a letter to Emperor Trajan asking the question, what should I do with these Christians once I round them up? But before he sent the letter, he did a little investigating because he decided he needed to educate himself on what made these Christians so dangerous. And he incorporated his findings in this letter and it actually survived antiquity. And here's what Pliny the Younger discovered about the Christian community 45 years after the Apostle Paul was executed by Rome. Here's what he discovered. He includes this in the letter. Here's what I found out. The sum and substance of their fault, because clearly they're at fault or we wouldn't be rounding them up, or error had been that they were accustomed to meet on a fixed day of the week before dawn. So I sent out my spies. I actually arrested a few Christians, you know, kind of beat them up a little bit, roughed them up a little bit to find out what's going on. What do you believe? What are you up to? Why is this a threat to the empire? And one thing I discovered is they meet together on a certain day of the week before dawn. Well, they would meet on Sunday to celebrate the resurrection of Jesus. But Sunday's a work day. There's no weekend. It's a work day. So they would meet before dawn, before work to celebrate and to worship together. Now imagine if we moved our church services to Monday morning at 5.30 a.m. and we'd worship for an hour together. How many of you would show up? Yeah, these are our people. This is how committed they were. This is how moved and changed they were. And when they would get together early in the morning before dawn, we found out that they sing. Whoa. How's the empire gonna survive people singing? This is such a threat. They sing a responsively a hymn and they sing to Christ as if he's some kind of God. So next time we're singing and you don't like the song or next time we're singing and you just don't like to sing, I want you to think about this. 
Our people, 2,000 years ago, the people that took this to the next generation after the apostle Paul and Peter would gather and they would sing. And the reason they would sing is because most people couldn't read. And not only could they not read, they had nothing to read. There's no B-I-B-L-E. I mean, they may have a fragment of a gospel or they may have a fragment of one of Paul's letters or Peter's letters, but in many of these communities, there was nothing to read and nobody could read. And so they learned their theology through chants and through um, poems and primarily through songs. So they would sing a hymn. This was their way of worshiping Christ as if he was a God. And here's the other thing we found out, Emperor Trajan. And while they were together, they would bind themselves by oath. Ah, this is where it's gonna get dangerous. They bind themselves by an oath. They take an oath, and I'm sure this oath has something to do with undermining the empire. This oath must have something to do with creating some kind of insurrection. I mean, maybe this is an oath that's gonna create some kind of slave revolt. I mean, we don't know, but what, what is this dangerous oath that they take? Not to some crime, we were surprised to find out. No, well, what were they taking an oath for? Here's what they vowed together to do. Instead, but not to commit fraud. They're, they're, they're not gonna steal from people or charge people too much or treat people dishonestly when it comes to finances or trading. They, just, they, they promised each other they would not defraud people. And they promised they wouldn't steal from anybody. And they promised out loud to each other that they wouldn't commit adultery or falsify their trust, that is not follow through on a promise. This sounds dangerous. I mean, we can't have people like this in our culture, in our towns, in our villages. I think when Plenty the Younger discovers all this, he realizes, no wonder I haven't heard about this. These are some of the finest people in the community and I'm supposed to arrest them? Now, let me tell you what's amazing about this. Again, this is kind of a dud. Uh, this is kind of this common sense, you know, self-evident, right? In the pagan religions, there was, there was no morality or ethics related to pagan worship. There was civil law, you know, to keep people in line. But when it came to the gods, the gods didn't care how you treated other people. The gods didn't care how you treated your wife. The gods didn't care how you treated your children. The gods didn't care. They just wanted their blood sacrifice. They just wanted their grain offerings. You're just you know, trying to bribe the gods. And suddenly here's this, this cult and they feel that somehow in their worship of their God, there is a moral component and an ethical component as if they feel accountable to God they feel accountable to God for how they treat each other. And they feel accountable to God for how they treat people in the community. Imagine, imagine what would happen in our community. Imagine what would happen in our country if every week Christians gathered in circles and they made an oath to each other this week I will not defraud anyone financially. This week, I'm not gonna steal anything, any ideas or any credit. This week, I will be faithful once again to my wife or to my husband. This week, I'm not gonna let anybody down. I'm gonna follow through on what I promised. Imagine such a world. Nor, this goes on, he says, the other part of the oath was nor to refuse to return a trust. If somebody's counting on me, they can count on me when called upon to do so. You know, plenty of the younger is like, that's it. That's all you got. That's all we could find out. We tortured a few Christians and sent some people in to be amongst them. And that's all we got. So this is the group that's angering the gods. This is the group that's undermining the empire. This is the group we're to around, round up and eliminate. See, this made no sense. This was so countercultural in a culture that worshiped strength, in a culture that worshiped warfare, in a, cur in a culture that worshiped conquest and victory. The ruling class found this pathetic, pitiful. I mean, it's, this, this is ridiculous. They're, they're worshiping a crucified, you know, rabbi. What is with this? And from their perspective, the whole thing was just kind of weird and appalling. But for many, Many people found the upside down kingdom of Jesus appealing. Christians refused to abandon the sick because they no longer feared death. Christians no longer abandoned babies because everyone's made in the image of God. 
And Christians no longer left children out to die that they didn't think they could afford to raise because they were made in the image of God. And as we talked about, then they would go out to the edge of the forest and the edge of villages where babies were often left and they would bring these children in and raise them. Who are these people? They extended dignity to their slaves and their servants and the people that weren't in their class. Who are these people? They're our people. Jordan Peterson sums it up perfectly. He says this, Christianity achieved the well nigh impossible. This is the part we cannot even begin to get our minds around. The Christian doctrine elevated the individual soul. This was unheard of. Placing slave and master and commoner and nobleman alike on the same metaphysical footing, rendering them equal before God and the law. The implicit, so powerful, the implicit transcendent worth of each and every soul established itself against impossible odds. The kingdom of God, as described by Jesus, struck the ancients as appalling, eventually appealing, and in time it became contagious and it swept the empire like an airborne disease. And against all odds, a Nazarene cult, or as the book of Acts, they refer to it as a Nazarene sect. They're following a dead Nazarene, a Nazarene sect who worship a crucified rabbi with no territory, no military, no authority, no political power, no political standing, <laughs> whose message was built around these pathetic two ideas, love your enemy and love each other, not only survived and thrived, it shaped Western civilization. And we, every single Jesus follower here and listening or watching is part of that movement. And we dare not, this is why, we dare not be divided over party lines knowing that one day those parties will be over. And if those who came before us, who are so different from us, if those who came before us that lived in a world we can't even begin to imagine, if somehow they were able to find common ground with each other at the foot of the cross, we have no excuse. Their culturally disruptive unity shocked the world. And eventually their message would change the world. So come on. Let's do that. Because, come on, you know this. Let's be super honest for a minute. We run the risk of being divided over some very important issues. We run the risk of being divided over some very important issues that you are passionate about. Passionate about. But, let's just, again, let's be honest. It may be impossible for you, and I understand this, and this is where I've gotten you know, negative feedback for this whole series. I get this. It may be impossible for you to understand how a Jesus follower could possibly have a different view on a specific issue than you have. It just, you may never get there. I can't imagine, you call yourself a Christian and you're still for this? You call yourself a Christian and you're still against this? You call yourself a Christian and you can't see that? You call yourself a Christian and you don't understand that? You may never ever understand why other Christians don't see political issues and social issues the way that you do. You may never understand how they could be for what you're against and against what you're for. So when you go to vote, you need to vote your law of Christ informed conscience. Absolutely. When you go to vote, you don't vote based on trying to make a bunch of people happy. You vote your conscience. But in the meantime, let's do what the early church did and let's carry each other's burdens. Because when you help me carry my burden, you gain understanding about who I am, where I sit, and consequently where I stand. And when you help me carry my burden, I get a better understanding of where you sit and consequently where you stand. And when we carry each other's burdens, there's something that happens that can't happen any other way. And we may never agree politically, but we can love unconditionally because we'll gain a better understanding of each other. And even if we never understand each other, and even if we never agree, if we carry one another's burdens, do you know what we do? We do the most important thing. We fulfill the law 
of Christ. Let me say it a different way. You do not have to understand me or agree with me to love me. And I do not have to agree with you or even understand why you view things the way you do to love you. We can disagree politically. We can love unconditionally while we pray and work for unity. So let's do this. Let's, come on, this is a unique opportunity. It's a unique, unique opportunity for our communities and for our nation. Let's not miss the opportunity of a lifetime, the invitation to follow the king who turned everything upside down and reversed the order of things. So let's listen. Let's learn. Let's love. And together, we will make our towns better. We will make our community better. We can make the nation better. We can make the world better. And that's not hyperbole. Because once upon a time, a handful of Jesus followers multiplied to the point to where the empire finally threw their hands up and embraced the crucified God. And if we get this right, perhaps we will leave our nation a little bit less divided. After all, one is the win. I hope that message was as helpful to you as it was to me in really helping me regain a proper perspective and seeing what really is important. Yes, this election has some important elements to it. It is an important part of our culture and society. But you know what? It's not the most important thing in the world. In fact, to God, the most important thing in the world is you and me. It's people. That's what's most important. And Andy made it very clear that as we look at our position to each other, as well as in, and especially before God, we are all in the same position before God. None of us is perfect. We are all sinners and we all need God and we all find salvation the same way. None of us can earn it. None of us deserve it. Uh, we all have it offered as a gift from God to us. Jesus died. He was buried and he rose again for you and for me. And I am so grateful for that, that I can take that gift and make it a, not only a part of my life, but my very core of living. And I hope that you have seen that need in your own life. If you have never accepted Christ as your Savior, I hope that you'll do that. I'm not trying to push a church. I'm not trying to push a religion per se. But this relationship with God, this position before God where you know for certain that if your life here were to end, and God forbid that would happen, but if your life were to end, that you would know for certain that you are a part of God's family and that you are with him for eternity. I hope that you will take that step. And as I have done all of these weeks, I'm going to lead us in a prayer that's very similar to what I prayed when I accepted Christ as my Savior. And again, there is no magical prayer. It's not, you know, some kind of special hocus pocus thing you say. It's a, it's a decision of your heart. It's a decision where you say, I'm no longer going to try and trust myself. I am no longer going to try to work my way to heaven. All of the good deeds I do are going to be an expression of love and gratitude for what God's done for me by sending Jesus. And, and you can trust him today. And a great way to express that to yourself, to God, is to let him know by praying. And so I'm going to just pray a prayer, and I'll display it right here for you. If you'd like to follow along, feel free to do so as I pray out loud. And you can pray out loud or pray in your mind. God can hear your thoughts. And so whatever you would like to do, just follow along. You can even put your own words in. But God loves you, and he wants you to be a part of his family. Would you pray? Dear God, Thank you that I don't have to work my way into your family. I know that no one is good enough except your son, Jesus. I realize I'm a sinner and that there's nothing I can do to earn or deserve salvation. Thank you for offering forgiveness and eternal life as a gift of your grace simply because you love me. I believe Jesus is your only son, who died on the cross, was buried, and rose from the dead for my sin. Today I put my faith and trust in you. Thank you for receiving me as your child forever. Thank you for promising to be with me always. In Jesus' name, amen. 
If you prayed that prayer, I would love to know about that. I would just love to rejoice with you and help you with your first steps in your walk with God, your journey of faith here. And uh, if there's anything I can do, some of you say, you know, I've been listening to you or maybe you heard me for the first time today. And um, of course, you listen to Andy. But maybe as I was sharing the fact that, you know, you can know for certain that you are part of God's family. Uh, maybe you'd like some more information. Maybe you'd like to talk. We, you know, message me. I'll be glad to give you my phone number. We can talk, we can text, we can email, whatever. However I can be of help to you, I certainly want to be that. So just let me know how I can help you and I'll be so grateful. Hey, I want you to know that uh, whatever happens at this election, I am confident. I am cheerful. I am looking forward to what God has. You know why? Because the fact that, you know, one person's a president or the other person's the president, sure, there's things that we may see uh, do differently. They might, you know, make some decisions that we don't like or whatever, and maybe even steer the whole country in a direction we don't want to go. Can I tell you something? God is still God. Jesus Christ is still the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. He's on the throne. He's got this. We're, we don't have to worry. We don't have to be fearful. So whatever side of the fence you might be, find yourself on, uh, I want you to know you can put yourself, you could put your life in God's hands and have a confidence that I guarantee you no presidential election will ever give you. All right. Hey, I hope this finds you well, and I will be praying for you, and I hope that uh, we will connect again next week. I am really looking forward to some new messages I want to share with you, and I know it's going to be a help and a blessing to you. Hey, thanks again for joining me today, and I look forward to connecting with you soon. Take care, and God bless. These are challenging times. The division and frustration are palpable. The balance is constantly shifting. The lines consistently blurred. Truths, half-truths, lies, mixed messages, confusing headlines, all in the middle of a nation whose back has been broken. Hope is drowned out by fear. Peace is muted by chaos. Dreams are crushed by reality. Finding God in the midst of this moment is difficult. As the election draws closer, countless voices will try to sway you one way or the other. Yet your responsibility is simple. Pray earnestly. Seek God passionately. Listen carefully and vote how he leads you. God is sovereign. He always has been. He is faithful. He always will be. And nothing, absolutely nothing happens outside of his providence. This is where we find peace in this moment.